For the past 10 years, I've had the privilege of coaching middle school co-ed soccer. And one of the lessons I've learned early on in my coaching time was that it's not about having the best players, but it's about having a team that's willing and able to follow the game plan. For middle school soccer, the game plan is really simple. It's all about trusting your teammate. It's all about spacing and keeping that ball out of the middle of the field. What I've learned is that regardless of talent, teams that trust the game plan and that follow the game plan are always more successful. Teams that choose not to follow the game plan, they never live up to their full potential. The principle of following a game plan can also be applied to the church, and more importantly, to discipleship, which is what Jesus has called every follower of him to do. To understand this, we first have to make a definition of what a disciple is. The biblical definition of a disciple is a follower of Jesus who is intentionally and relationally making other disciples who are making other disciples. It sounds easy, but if you don't follow the game plan, it becomes extremely challenging. And where do we get this game plan from? Well, from Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus comes to his disciples, the ones that he's been pouring into for over three years. He comes to them and he tells them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you to the very ends of the age. We've heard that Bible verse many, many times. We've heard those words of Jesus. And the truth is that in his life, his death, his resurrection, Jesus accomplishes everything for the salvation of people who had run so far away from him because of sin. His life, death, and resurrection gives him all authority to bring salvation to this world. And what does Jesus say? He says to his small group of believers that have been following him from the beginning, he says, I have the authority and I wanna give it to you. I want you to go. I want you to go to all people. I want you to go to all nations. I want you to go to all who are far off. I want you to go to those who are still running away from me because of sin. And I want you to tell them how to follow Jesus. It's a very simple concept and it can be very, very scary too. But Jesus also gives us some very important words. He tells us, and surely I am with you to the very ends of the age. We get so caught up in how fearful making a disciple can be, we forget that we have the one with all authority on our side who is with us through the entire process. And you know what's amazing? Is that's exactly what this small group of believers did. They went, and wherever they went, they took Jesus with them. And they did it through one-on-one -on -one relational and intentional discipleship. They brought this message to the world. And their results were astonishing. By the year 100 AD, this ragtag group of small Christians had gone from just a handful to almost 25 thousand believers in Jesus. And how did they do that? One-on-one, -on -one, intentional and relational discipleship. A disciple makes a disciple who makes a disciple, and so on. And the results became exponential. And what we see over the next couple hundred years is that exponential growth. It's truly astonishing. In the year 8100, there's approximately 25,000 believers in Jesus. You flash forward to the year 300 AD, and that number has exploded to 20 million believers in Jesus Christ, all through the art and following the game plan of Jesus of intentional discipleship. See, when you follow the game plan, God is going to bless it. 
And the scary part about this is, is right around this time, the church made a decision. It made a decision to stop following the game plan in the way that they had always been doing. In around 310 AD, Emperor Constantine of the Roman Empire becomes a Christian because someone discipled him. But immediately, he declared that all of the Roman Empire had to become Christian. And in that moment, the church decided that it was more important to start gathering instead of going. And at, at that time, they built the first large churches. They, they started focusing on attracting people to the church instead of following the game plan of Jesus and going. It's amazing, in those first couple hundred years of the church, they didn't have any resources. They didn't have any of the things that we think that we need to go and make disciples. But what did they have? They had obedience to the call and the command of Jesus. They had the Holy Spirit on their side, inviting them to be a part of what God is doing when we're obedient to his call. And this isn't the only time that we see this. Yes, the church stopped going like they should, but there were times, and there's been times even in recent history where we've seen this intentional form of biblical discipleship explode in areas in our world. In China, in the underground church is one of, a, one of the best examples. When the Chinese government decided to make Christianity illegal, there were approximately two million Christians in China. Many of the leaders of the Christian church were killed and they were told that they could not share the gospel in any way, shape, or form, and missionaries weren't allowed in the country. During that time of oppression, those two million Christians went underground, but they didn't go in silence. They went making disciples. And when the church was finally able to come back in, they thought they were gonna find a ruined China. And what they found was that two million people had exploded to approximately 60 million people. We also see an example in the late, uh, mid to late 1700s in America. Before it was America, as the country was growing and people were moving here, the Methodist Church took on this intentional discipleship process. And in just a few short years, over 50% of the people who were moving to the United States or what would become the United States, they would become Methodist through this process. So we know that this process works. See, the principle of following the game plan is even more powerful when we focus it on Jesus. He's going to bless us when we follow the game plan. He's called us to go and make disciples. In Ephesians chapter one, the apostle Paul writes, about what God wants to do in the church and what Jesus wants to do when we are obedient to his call. Starting at verse 17, he says this. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come and God who placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The apostle Paul speaks here of the authority that Jesus won through his life, death, and resurrection. He speaks of the prayer that God placed on his heart, that all people would come to the knowledge that Jesus is their savior. Jesus wants all people to know him. He wants them to know the incomparable riches that he has in store for them. 
He wants them to know his great love for them and how he can transform their lives. For us who do know him, we know the hope that we have. We know the blessing that he pours into our lives. We know how he sustains us in all circumstances. Don't we want other people to know that and to feel that same thing? That's what this process of discipleship is all about. It's about taking the hope that Jesus has given us, taking the knowledge and the peace and the comfort and all of that that he fills us with to a world that doesn't know it. Sadly, in the church, if you ask how many of you have been discipled, most will say they haven't. The church needs to get back to that one-on-one -on -one intentional discipleship. Theologians and church leaders around the world at this time are coming to this realization. The church strayed from being the going entity that Jesus intended us to be, to a come and gather. Come, we want to attract you. God's game plan is always going to be better than ours. And so through this time, as we go through this series, we want to invite you to prayerfully consider making discipleship a part of your life. Who can disciple you? Who's God placing on your heart to disciple? And we also want you to think about what it would be like to be part of that exponential growth as one person disciples one person who disciples another person and so on. So we're excited to invite you on this journey of discipleship. Let's dig into God's word together now.